and um, it may. It's on. Make sure folks can hear me. That's perfectly fine. Don't worry, there's no required. Splash uh, <laughs> them. There's no pointing participation. It's very open participation. Mm -mm. I don't think I was an official member. I came to a luncheon or to a like a coffee. You guys used to do like the coffee socials and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That was probably the last one I attended. Was the online stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. New year, new job. <laughs> Do you get to remote work at all? <laughs> Normally, I would just yell to get everyone's attention, but I've done a lot of that recently, so my voice is gone. Um, but thank you all for being here tonight. I'm super excited for the first Fish and Friends of 2024. Excited to hear the Lindsay's <laughs> talk. Yay. Um, excited to see some familiar faces. Happy New Year's to you guys, and excited to see faces too. Um, so before we get started, how Fish and Friends works is we should do some upcoming program announcements. We'll do some community announcements too. So if anybody has anything in the local community they'd like to announce or make people aware of, we'll have time for that as well. And then we'll do the talk. Time for questions at the end as well. Uh, so things coming up for us, a couple of virtual programs. So we have Into the Booth Look Book club it's a virtual book club so you can attend from anywhere you don't even have to turn your camera on you could be in like your pajamas haven't showered in three days sitting in bed like, perfectly fine um you don't even have to read the book um lots of people <laughs> wow. My I, I, I attend the book club and i almost never read the book <laughs> i read a couple pages i mean to read the whole thing but i just don't end up but I still have a great time. It's a fun time. The author is usually there talking about the book, and you can ask some questions too. So it's a super fun time. It's at 8 p.m. on Thursday, January 18th. And then our next uh, virtual program is a fish and art, which for those of you who don't know, fish and ours are a online webinar to teach you about fish in different parts of the world. So this one is looking at the um, tropical Pacific look alike fishes. And it's called Fish and Art Look Twice and Take Pictures. So it should be a fun one. Chuck Curry's teaching that. He's a very avid surveyor, knows a lot of fish, so definitely will be a good one. They're all um, recorded and put on our website, so you can look at that even afterwards if you want to just fall asleep to the sound of Chuck talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Every night, because it's so soothing, you can do that. They're all on the website. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have Grouper Moon live streams coming up. For those of you who don't know, Grouper Moon is a project that surrounds that fish over there in the bottom corner, NASA Grouper. They are an endangered species, and we have a project researching, protecting, and um, documenting them in the Cayman Islands. If you're interested in hearing more about that project, you can tune into the live streams at the spawning aggregations in Little Cayman, January 29th, 30th, and February 1st. Anybody can listen in on those. They'll be um, live streamed on our YouTube. We speak fish. So it should be easy mm -hmm. to remember. Okay. Thank you. And the last announcement I have is that we have some new staff here Yay. and our new interns. Yay. Yay. So um, Jill and Kinder want to come and introduce yourselves. Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody! Welcome. Can you hear me? This yep. Is going yeah. It's for the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Jill Keenert, and I am the new campus director here at Reef Headquarters in Key Largo, Florida. 
This is a new position and it's my second day. So we're still <laughs> figuring out all the wonderful things that we're gonna do together. But I've been a long time member of Reef and I can tell you after two days working with this group that I'm even more impressed and inspired and excited about the mission of this organization to help conserve and protect our oceans through education and outreach. I look forward to getting to know all of you better and thank you for joining us this evening. Hi, I'm Kendra Parks and um, I'm originally from Kansas City, so I've been in the Keys about two years. I've lived on both coasts. I went to USC, so I've lived over there and now I'm here in the Florida Keys. I've been here for a couple of years and I'm going to be the operations manager. So we don't know exactly what that's going to look like. <laughs> um, we're kind of finding out it's also my second day. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and just like every time around this time of year, we have four lovely new interns. If you guys would like to come up and introduce yourselves. as far as you, but 15 hours away. And I studied at the University of Mary Washington. I studied conservation biology pretty broadly. And I ended up coming here after I spent some time at the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation, furthering my studies in conservation. Wow. Hi, I'm Elliot. I am from California, um, about near the Bay Area, San Francisco area. I am currently going to Northeastern University. I'm here for the spring, so yeah. That's over in Boston. Um, I'm studying marine biology, and I'm excited to be here, learn new things, learn more about the ocean, sort of same as Nick here, and yeah. Nice. Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Ella. I am originally from Turkey, but I went to school in Boston. Um, that's in college specifically. I studied economics, environmental economics, and I did my thesis on blue, econ blue economy and marine financing strategies for the entire Mediterranean Sea Basin. So very excited to learn more about citizen science and how that could apply to conservation as a whole. And yeah, just an honor to be here and learn from all of you as well. Still in the French row with me? We're not You'll see them around. They'll be here till mid May, so they'll be in my house. They'll be at every fish and friend. So, if, again, if you miss them, we'll just see them next month. So, um, last announcement is the um, Fish and Friends for this year is help, uh, funded by a Florida Humanities Grant. So, part of that is um, reporting on the grants. So we like to do surveys for grants. For those of you who don't know how grants usually run, they like to hear feedback on how the programs you're funding are doing. So that's what all those sheets of paper there are. You can fill it out at any time during this um, event, and you can hand it back to Noah, who's not in the room right now. Um, she's helping clean up outside. So thank you, Noah, for cleaning up. Um, she'll be back in here as go at the end of the talk, and I'll point her out to you guys. So if you can fill those out, it means a lot to us. It shouldn't take too long, and it um, will help make the people who gave us the funding really happy. Um, if you had a bad time, then we are Core Restoration Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway. January 27th will be a native plant day. This happens once a year, and local residents can come. You do have to pay park admission, do it. but if you want to get in there, you can go to the native plant day event, and you can pick up two plants per person or four per family, as long as you're a resident of the Keys. Great. And until the 13th, you can get a half price steak for annual pass. Oh. Oh. $60 for a family. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it gets you into all of the parks. Yes. All of them. All of the parks. And which date was that again, Jada? Which date? That's 
Saturday, January 27th from 9 a.m. to noon. Saturday, January 27th, 9 a.m. to noon. There'll be a lecture and, uh, and uh, tropical hardwood and walks. Great. Great. Oh, that's great. Another Pentacamp event. Oh my gosh. Another this Pentacamp Saturday <laughs> at 5.30. 5 o'clock? 5 o'clock. We are having an annual meeting, but followed by stargazing presentation. Yeah. With Mike Hughes, for those yeah. of you that did presentations with him. So instead of looking down at the fishes, we'll look up at the stars. So um, that's a story event. Stargazing. You're arranging for it to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> we there's a <laughs> there's a planetarium uh, program as a backup, so don't worry. We have all the weather contingencies figured out. I've been fretting about it for a week. His telescope is amazing. Any other Lisa. Oh, is there a history of diving museum? Oh yes, immerse yourself. Immerse yourself. Is next okay. Wednesday. Yes. It'll be about Mission Iconic Reefs and Iconic Reef Guardians. It will not be me. It'll be Maddie Chilnoki, for those of you that know her, uh, and JD. So. And it's the opening of their new art exhibit. Oh, yeah. Well, but, but you can see it on Wednesday. Hawk is on Wednesday. I'm glad you all chose to be here tonight with all the action. Yes. I would too. Um, I'm Vanessa. I work at the State National Park, and we have an amazing volunteer program where we take volunteers for a day, take them out to the northernmost Florida Keys on Elliott Key, and a lot of those really important procedural nesting habitats, and remove burning debris for the day, have lunch up there and everything. Um, so if you want more information, you can find us on Facebook, just the State National Park. It's all over our Facebook page, or you can come to me. I'll bring you on the boat. So, talk to Vanessa. Road trip. Any other announcements? It's a little bit of a uh, psychological test here. There's a QR code up here. This is a, uh, a preview of what's going to happen later. If you have a phone and would like to get a head start and want to scan that QR code. We're going to be doing a little bit of audience participation a little bit later on. Um, that's going to be through your phone or electronic device. Um, if you pull it up, just wait. Don't worry. Oh, yep. See, there you go. Already. Are we really going to miss something wonderful if we don't have our phones with us? Should we go get phones? Should we go get phones? Um, no, you will not miss something wonderful because it'll be populating with other people live. <laughs> wanted to give all of our attention. <laughs> the uh, federal government computer does not like the internet here, so give us just a moment. As you can imagine, it's full of all sorts of security things to make sure I don't get, you know, give any government secrets away. It says I'm connected to the Wi Fi, but I can. Um... What's that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to hit the? So we're still trying. <laughs> yeah, it's reconnected. I can. Uh, you want to disconnect and forget it again? No. Why is there so many fish on the sea floor? They dropped out of school. Oh. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. I like that. She'll be here all week. She'll be here all week. That's the deal. I guess we're Yes, it's on my phone. I'll do birds. Why do why do seagulls? So it might not have updated here. Is it 
for those of you that are online, bear with us. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties. <laughs> I don't know it. Zero <laughs> three oh five. I need an adult. So for those of you that are while well, we're waiting for that. If you would like to scan the QR code, we're going to be using an online program called Mentimeter, which does live audience participation. Uh, the folks online uh, will be able to participate as well. Sierra has that um, information available. Wait until I prompt you to do it, just because there's some questions there that you all will, will absolutely be able to answer. Um, I just don't want you to answer it just yet. Perfect. See, you are the hero. Yeah. The hero. All right, let's make sure our online folks are able to see what I'm talking about. Yes, thank you. We're good. Beautiful, all right. All right, so let's try this again. Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. Uh, my name is Lindsay Cruz. I'll tell you a little bit more about me a little bit later. Um, some of you probably looked at this title and you're like, I have no idea what she's talking about, but they have wine and food, so I'm going to show up anyway. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of different things. We're going to talk a little bit about the human connection to the waters of the Florida Keys from a historical standpoint. Um, keep in mind, I am not an archaeologist or a historian. Uh, I am not Brad Bertelli, so uh, if you see him, you can ask all the questions you want. Um, this will be focused on a couple of different stories. It's just to provide some sort of historical context for the second half of the presentation which is going to focus a little bit more on the psychology and sociology of how we connect to the oceans today. Um, so when they asked me to do Fish and Friends, this is a bucket list thing for me, by the way. I've lived here nine years and haven't done a Fish and Friends presentation yet. <laughs> um, I was like, I want to do something that you're not going to be able to see somewhere else. There's no one who's going to necessarily be giving a presentation about this nerdy stuff that I'm going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit on our education program at the sanctuary and what kind of science we use in order to communicate about ocean issues and how we talk about the ocean to people based on current research. This research is super recent, uh, 2023 um, has a updated a lot of our research. Uh, things have changed since the lockdown and the pandemic, right? Um, so I'm gonna pull back the curtain a little bit. Uh, so you're gonna hear a little bit of history, a little bit of psychology, a little bit of sociology. So all the good humanities things. So a little bit about me. My name is Lindsay Cruz. I'm the Science and Outreach Coordinator for Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. I sit on both our science team and education teams. Um, for our education team, I help bring that research to our educators to help improve our programs. I also um, like to do exhibits and museum design. That's what my master's degree focused on. So again, super niche item. Um, for my science folks, how many of you have been to a science presentation and it was really boring, right? My job is to coach our scientists on how to talk about challenging topics and how to make their programs more engaging. Uh, because science is great, but it does no good if the average person doesn't understand it. Uh, so I also get to dive. I'm a marine biologist in training. I love corals. I'm not a fish person. Sorry, Reef. Uh, I'm working on it. Um, some of you in this room know me from my time at John Pennacant State Park. I moved down here nine years ago to be a park ranger. I was the education specialist for a while. Uh, my master's degree is in environmental education and interpretation uh, from University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Um, I'm a certified interpretive guide through the National Association for Interpretation, which is the um, certifying agency for people who do what I do. And in my spare time, uh, I am in graduate school at FIU, <laughs> and I also teach Irish dance. So all the weird things that are going on here. So it's no secret to anybody in this room that the history of the Florida Keys is intricately tied to the ocean, both now where we are currently and historically. For some, the ocean was a source of food, transportation, and a part of daily life. 
For colonizers, it was a pathway to riches and a pathway to riches and advancement of their causes. For others, the ocean was a mechanism for their oppression. Our ocean carries beneath its waves stories of ingenuity, heroism, and excitement on the high seas. But for others, it also conceals stories of destruction, piracy, and enslavement. The historical treasures of the sanctuary help the, sa the treasures that the sanctuary protects help our archaeologists be able to uncover these stories and be able to share these stories with others. And that's super important because understanding what has happened in the past helps us to appreciate what we have now and appreciate our future. This includes the parts of history that excite us and the parts of history that should never be forgotten or erased. For indigenous people, the ocean and the water is a part of their daily lives. And we're gonna talk about indigenous people in the is because they are still here. They are still here in Florida. Long before Europeans arrived, native people, the Florida Keys, collected native fruits and berries, pulled things out of the ocean to engineer as tools and possibly weapons. And as colonizers came throughout the Caribbean, shipwrecked sailors and um, fishers brought with them infectious diseases that wiped out a lot of our native peoples here in the Keys. Their descendants, their, they may have been part of the Tequesta, Calusa, and Matacumbi tribes. At least our archaeologists believe so. We don't have any indigenous sites that we have discovered yet in the sanctuary. I always put that yet because we're always looking. Their descendants today are part of the Miccosukee and Seminole tribes, who, as some of you may know, remain unconquered. They have never signed a peace treaty with the US federal government. They are an unconquered tribe. Now, while the ocean was used to sustain the indigenous people for others traveling through, the ocean was a pathway for riches and advancement and also a huge danger. The Florida Keys, here we are, right over here, in this very beautiful map that someone drew a really long time ago. We're the northern boundary for the Gulf Stream. And so people that were traveling throughout the Caribbean had to pass by us in order to take a quick trip home. As you can imagine, in the time that this map was created, there were no GPS units. You couldn't have, you know, you didn't have a cell phone to tell you where to take your turns. Um, and there really weren't very well drawn maps of the area. And so as you can imagine, even with those things today, people still run aground. Uh, back then, people ran aground quite a bit, which is really unfortunate. There's an estimated 2,000 shipwrecks inside the Florida Keys. And the era of European colonization is kind of that first marker for these shipwrecks to appear. 2,000 shipwrecks, that's a lot. This is Key West, a lot different <laughs> <laughs> than how it looks today. <laughs> but both historically and today, Key West has served as an important military outpost and an extension for US dominance in the Caribbean. The relationship between Key West and Cuba has always been a unique one but it hasn't always looked like how it looks today. This is one of those cool shipwreck stories I'm gonna tell you about, because this is actually current research happening in your sanctuary right now. That steamship on the far side is a ship called the Valbonera. The Valbonera was a Spanish steamship that carried passengers and cargo. In 1919, the ship was en route from, to Havana from Santiago de Cuba, where some of its passengers had disembarked. Those folks were the lucky ones. As Valbonera approached Havana, the winds started to pick up and so did the seas. And so the harbor at Havana had to shut down. So there was no pilot boat to bring them in. So the captain had no choice but to head out to deeper water to ride out whatever storm this was that was appearing. Does anyone know what happened in 1919 in Key West? 1919? Uh, was the strongest hurricane to ever hit Key West directly in history. By today's standards, it was estimated to be a Category 4 storm. After what had to be a really traumatic night, um, the crew was unable to deploy lifeboats and all 488 people, crew, and passengers were lost. Anyone an Ernest Hemingway fan? Yeah, of course, you're in the Keys, who doesn't, right? 
After the Storm is a short story written by Ernest Hemingway, and it was written, the inspiration for that was the Valbanera. And it was, the inspiration for that was from a tale he had heard in town about people trying to salvage goods off the wreck. Today, the Valbanera has been discovered uh, and is partially buried in an area known as the Quicksands off of Key West. Our archeologists have partnered with the University of Miami to help discover more information about the Valbanera while respecting it as a final resting place for over 400 people. These images were created using orthomosaic technology. Those of you that are familiar with the coral restoration world, orthomosaics is something that you're probably familiar with already. But for those of you that are like, what in the world is that big word you're talking about? The archeologists are gonna take these big kind of camera arrays and they move up and down the different ship parts and pieces, taking thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of pictures. A computer program stitches them all together and it gives us a really high resolution image that archeologists are able to look at from their computers, not just while they're on their scuba tank, which is a real big game changer in both the archeology span world and the coral world. Because it gives us more time to look at it, right? Our hope is to tell the stories of the people who were lost on that vessel. What were they like? What was important to them? What were their names? In fact, our archeologists are, are interested in hearing stories, local folklore, and rumors that people may have heard in Key West um, and Cuba from that vessel. They're also interested in hearing from the people who were fortunate enough to disembark in Santiago de Cuba and what their lives were like and how they felt after learning that those people had perished. down in families can help archaeologists piece together and share the stories of the average person who was on these ships. Key West became one of the richest communities in the nation during the 19th century due to wrecking, turtling, and sponging. How many folks have been to the turtle, the turtle docks in Key West? Yeah, they're right there on the harbor. I'm going to focus a little bit on wrecking because wrecking was such a big part of Florida Keys history including the next story that I'm going to tell you. We have to acknowledge the role that the ocean played in the oppression of lots and lots of people as they were being brought over from Africa. The story I'm going to tell today uh, is a really great shipwreck story and the fact that we know a lot about it, which is unusual for shipwrecks, but it also has a lot of elements to a good shipwreck story. So it was dark and stormy night. <laughs> in 1827, the HMS Nimble was patrolling the Gulf of Florida near the Bahamas. Its mission was to catch pirates, especially smugglers who were carrying people over from Africa. As Nimble was looking around, trying to see what was going on, they spotted a suspicious vessel. The captain of the Nimble, directed his helms in to set an intercept course. Now, what's the worst thing you can do when someone's trying to follow you? <laughs> to not look, to look suspicious. Nimble, or the, the, the ship of interest, the suspicious vessel, turned westward and tried to get away. They eventually met each other just off the coast of Key Largo. Vessels exchanged cannon fire, and shortly thereafter, Guerrero ran aground on the reef, and then Nimble followed shortly after. See, dark and stormy night, cannon fire. Guerrero, that suspicious vessel, had its bottom ripped open, and the vessel rolled onto its side. Nimble was in a lot better shape. It was less damaged, and although it was stuck on the reef, it actually remained afloat, which is fantastic for those folks. As the British sailors worked to save their vessel, they heard screams and shouts from within Guerrero and realized that it held enslaved Africans who were fighting for their lives as water filled their ship. And as you've probably seen in history textbooks, the conditions that these people were subjected to were not that great, to say the least. As people were transported across the middle passage, a lot of times they were held in the bottom of the vessel and chained to the bottom of the boat. The light of dawn revealed an appalling tragedy. 41 Africans had drowned or been crushed below decks as the Guerrero struck the reef. 520 people remained imprisoned on the vessel with 90 pirate crewmen 
to keep them there. After citing the grounded vessels from Caesars Creek, three Florida Keys records, known as the Thorn, the Surprise, and the Florida, sailed to the reef to render assistance. Thorn was the first to arrive on scene, so they were able to take charge of the situation. I'm going to say take charge of the situation in quotation marks. <laughs> it's kind of hard to take charge of that situation. They directed Florida to onboard 142 African people and 20 pirates and immediately set sail for Key West. There was a lot of people there. They wanted to start getting people down south, right? Thorne took on 246 African people and 54 pirates onto their vessel. And the crew of the Surprise worked to try and free the Nimble from the reef. The Nimble was able to get afloat, which is great. And the crew set about to try and repair the vessel as quickly as possible. All three vessels on the scene clustered together to try and keep the pirates from causing a revolt. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. <laughs> the pirate captain Jose Gomez and his crew seized the thorn. Some of the crew were able to get overboard so that way they weren't taken prisoner as well, but they detained the captain and several American sailors. Now Nimble, while afloat, didn't have a rudder. The rudder was gone and not operational. So Nimble was not able to give pursuit as the pirates took this vessel away. They did attempt to shoot at the vessel, but were unsuccessful. Not only did the pirates capture the Thorn, you guys remember that boat that left for Key West? They got captured too. Pirate crew took over and both of those vessels made it to Guerrero's final destination, which was Cuba. Having just experienced a horrific voyage and a wrecking that killed so many people, the people, the Africans that were on those pirate ships were placed onto Cuba's sugarcane plantations. The remaining 122 African people on board the Surprise were put under the protection of the wreckers until a fourth wrecker could get out there to assist. Surprise departed the following day. And the fourth wrecker and the nimble departed the day after that. Surprise reached Key West December 23rd, and the nimble and the General Gettys, which is the fourth wrecker, reached Key West on Christmas Eve. One African person did not survive the trip to Key West. Is anyone familiar with wreckers? What happens when you get to Key West with the people that saved your, your ship? Does anyone know? Yeah, so as wreckers were entitled to a portion of the ship's value because they assisted in getting it off the reef. So naturally, the captain of the Nimble got out of Key West as quickly as possible before his ship could be impounded. And so the wreckers didn't get anything for their deed in rescuing the Nimble. So 121 African people landed in Key West, and at that time, Key West was a mosquito-infested village of less than 500 people at the edge of the US nation. At the time in the United States, the buying and selling of enslaved people was illegal at the time, but owning them was not. And so these people were stuck in this really weird legal limbo, limbo as far as the American government was concerned. They couldn't be sold, but people could still own them. It created a lot of legislative conflict up in DC. Their custodian was a U.S. Marshal who gave them food, clothing, and medical treatment while they were there, but was having trouble as people were trying to kidnap them from their place they were staying in Key West and force them into slavery. During the time the African people were in Key West, illness claimed six more lives. In March of 1828, 114 Africans embarked on a schooner for St. Augustine. Why St. Augustine, you ask? Well, once they landed in St. Augustine, the African children who were deemed too young to work were placed with local families. The U.S. Marshals sent the adults and children to the older children to plantations in order to cover their food and lodging expenses. Kingsley Plantation took on 36 African people and Malacompra Plantation took on 20. And although they were technically free under U.S. law because no one could own them, they were nevertheless subjected to the same treatment as the African people who were on the plantation at that time. The US government ultimately determined the best course of action was to repatriate them to Africa, to a place known as Liberia. Now, while it's, Liberia was a destination for them, it more than likely was not any of their homes. On their way home, 
They almost wrecked again and had to stop in Barbados. And eventually they made it to a colony in Africa known in the US as New Georgia. It took three years from the time they wrecked in Key Largo till they made it to Africa again. 200 years, over 200 years has passed since the Guerrero shipwreck. Researchers and archeology span advocates have started to uncover the stories of people involved in this horrible tragedy in so many ways. Their experience provides a means to connect with millions of people who were forced to take the Middle Passage and with descendants who oftentimes can't trace their lineage back to their homeland. Kingsley Plantation, where these images are taken, is now a national park site located in St. Augustine. And these tabby houses are still standing if you want to go take a look at them. There are some incredibly powerful stories and research happening there to tell the stories of the enslaved people on that plantation. Now, the reason I like to talk about the Guerrero is because we know so much about it, which is amazing. And a lot of that has to do with a historian named Gail Swanson. In the 1990s, she uncovered this story in the archives and set to work. There's a really great book about it if you're interested. The historical account suggested that Guerrero grounded in an area that included the southern end of Biscayne National Park and John Pennekamp Coral Reef State Park, as well as the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Searches began in Biscayne and John Pennekamp State Park. Now, for those of you that have been in the Keys for a while and might have listened to a couple of archaeologists who have done a lot of work here, archaeology is not an area that is well-funded or well-staffed historically. And so a group of amazing people stepped in to help these archaeologists identify these shipwreck sites. These divers formed a nonprofit, and that volunteer group is called Diving with a Purpose. And it's the Association of Black Scuba Divers, NABs, African American and Black Scuba Divers. Um, Diving with a Purpose has now grown to include engineers, archaeologists, and scientists. A potential site for these wrecks has been identified in John Pennekamp Coral Reef State Park. The characteristics of the two wreck sites and their location to each other suggested to Dr. Corey Malcolm of the Mel Fisher Museum that they represented the potential sites for the Guerrero and the Nimble. None of the artifacts discovered this far have said anything conclusive. An investigation is still pending in Biscayne, Pennekamp, and Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. In the past and today, for both good and bad reasons, the ocean is the focus for the Florida Keys way of life. Key West remains a cosmopolitan community at the crossroads of the Caribbean. Prior to tourism's takeover here in the Upper Keys, our area was lightly settled and focused on farming and fishing. We all connect to the waters of the Florida Keys in lots of different ways. And that's where the question on the Mentimeter comes in. So for those of you that have not seen a Mentimeter before, I'm offline again. <laughs> Let's see if we can get this one. Do you want to come and re-input the password? I don't think so. You shouldn't be able to. You shouldn't have to. Can make more than one answer? <laughs> uh, yeah, you might be able to. So the question is, how do you connect to the ocean and the Florida Keys? Um, I'm going to be sharing the Mentimeter slide, and it's going to auto-populate with responses as the responses come in. Okay, wave at me. <laughs> Beautiful. So how do we connect to the ocean in the Florida Keys? Breathe the air. I like that one. Breathing. Take a look at my car windshield any given day. Coral restoration. Environmentally, through photography, being on the water, teaching. Recreation, beauty. Diving. This, I, I actually 
was like, oh, I wonder what the big word is going to be here at Reef. <laughs> This should shock no one, right? <laughs> water chemistry. Oh, someone someone here is a water quality person or online water chemistry people. Love that. Exploring. Give folks online a couple of minutes to add some more if they would like. <clears throat> All right, so as you can see, we connect to the ocean in a ton of different ways. Through so many different activities and some really unique answers that I wasn't expecting. So good job, guys. Some good stuff. Let me reshare the screen for my folks online. We're going to be doing another mentee in just a few seconds. Sierra, are we back online? Um, we shared the screen yet? I did. Okay. It's not popping up, but. Okay. Maybe it'll go, maybe it's lagging. <laughs> So let's flip the script and talk about today's connection, but not in the scheme of the activities that we do, but in the way that we think about the ocean and we as communicators understand and communicate ocean issues. For the folks in the room, and if you're online, you can do it in the chat if you're able to see. What trends do you notice about these pictures? Blue. It's waves. blue, waves. Clear water. Surface, clear water. Some sun. So if you type the word ocean into Google, this is what pops up in Google Images. And these algorithms can actually tell us a lot about what people are thinking about a topic. Is there anything missing in any of these pictures? People, people fish, water. things in there, the, <laughs> an actual ocean, all sorts of stuff. So remember, we're talking about the average American, right? We're not talking about people who are in, embedded and ingrained in the ocean conservation. This will, might look a little bit different on your algorithm. It's no accident that these images are so similar. So this is what anthropologists call a cultural model. There are multiple cultural mindsets about any given topic or issue. Cultural mindsets are widely shared, they're durable, and they structure our way of thinking. And this is important, right? Because when we talk about the ocean, this is what most people think of. Blue water, nothing in it. How many of you heard that coral's a rock? I can stand on it, it's just a rock. Cultural mindsets are built over time through repeated interactions with people, institutions, and the media. If you think of your brain like a tall field of grass, if you walk through it once, the grass is gonna pop back in, no big deal. But if you walk through that path several times, eventually there's gonna be something dug in that space. This is how learning happens in a pictorial way. Culture is something that we learn from each other. Cognitive scientists have a term for this where many of these paths come together and they're called schemas. Cultural models are schemas that are passed from person to person until most or even all people within a group start to become familiar with them. These are reinforced by the things we see in daily life from media, between conversations and friends and family, things on TV and even games that we play as kids. New experiences are interpreted through this pathway and so once it's there, it's really hard to change. Some of us are more adventurous, right? We might do the pathway over here just to be different, but most people are gonna take the path that's already there. Let's talk about climate change. If I was to ask you how many people in the United States think climate change is happening right now, how many of you would have guessed this high of a number? No, and this, this, um, this data is from 2023. It is current data. In Florida, an FAU study that was conducted this year indicates that Floridians might actually be higher than the average American. Most of the time, that's pretty surprising for folks. You're like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> 
Well, the reason why you're like, oh, I don't know about that is because over half of those people never discuss climate change with people. We're not having conversations about it. We know that people care. 65% say this topic is important to them, but we don't talk about it. Why? Why don't we talk about it? Who here talks about climate change all the time? <laughs> Lots of hands. Excellent. Good. If I was to say this in Ocala or someplace around Lake Okeechobee, how many of them do you think talk about climate change? Where I'm from in southeastern Virginia, people don't talk about climate change. That's not a thing. It's something that happens to other people. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, and that's actually a phenomenon called psychological distance. So when something happens to you or someone you know personally, something is more real to you. And that's psychological distance isn't just the physical distance from me to you. It's also emotional and social distance as well. Social distance, not in the six feet apart kind of way. So how many of you have been to a presentation by a climate scientist and they throw all these graphs up on the wall with all sorts of stuff going around and you're like, oh God, you know, this is really complicated and I know it's bad. How many of you walk away from climate presentations like that? It's really complicated, but I know it's bad. How many of you walk away from those conversations going, this is really complicated and you felt overwhelmed? Like there's nothing we can do this is horrible. It's all going to, the world's going to blow up in a big ball of flames. <laughs> so research on how we communicate climate change has been studied over, for over a decade now, probably more than 20 years at this point, um, by an organization called the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, or NOCI, N-N-O-C-C-I for short. They've been able to synthesize research from several different areas in order to give educators, communicators, scientists, and social scientists a way to talk about climate change that uses data in order to prevent some of the anxiety that we feel when we talk about things like climate change. Me, as an early educator, I was afraid in rural North Carolina to talk about climate change, as many of you could imagine. It was scary. Training through organizations like NOKI helped to kind of settle those nerves and to give you a research-backed way to do it. To do that, they use a, a communication technique called framing. If you think of a picture frame, <laughs> you start at one corner and end up at the same corner. That's how framing works, which sounds one of those things of like, OK, Lindsay, yeah, you tell a story. You start at the beginning and you end at the beginning. How does that work? To start our climate frame, we start with a shared value. Now, research done over the past few years has told us that most American people rally around these two values as far as climate change is concerned. With the protection value, we're telling stories of things like, it's important to protect people and places from being harmed. How many of you disagree with that statement? Right? For responsible management, the story that we're telling is taking practical step-by-step -step solutions to big environmental problems facing our environment is in the best interest of future generations. How many of you disagree with that statement? Nope, right? So we rally around those values. Current research, this year we actually got a brand new value to use. I have not been able to use it yet, it's so new. Um, but our new value is fairness across places. We need to make sure that all Americans have healthy environments, no matter where they live. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm sure most of you do too. Another important component of research-backed climate communication is the use of explanatory metaphors. These metaphors are tested in the field and have a high rate of success for getting the average person to be able to tell you how climate change happens. The answer is probably going to be higher here than when I give a general presentation, but how many of you feel confident that you could explain how climate change is happening? All the good science around it. Yeah, lots of hands. Excellent. I would expect that from this group, right? When I give a talk in rural North Carolina, a lot of times people mention the ozone layer, the hole in the ozone. That's what's causing climate change. These explanatory metaphors help to change that and help to change the conversation. I'm going to show you an example of this in action, but you're going to be seeing the heat trapping blanket and regular and rampant CO2 a little bit later. But the other two 
that I like to talk about is the climate's heart. The ocean is the heart of the earth. That much like our heart pumps blood through our bodies, the ocean is pumping currents with warm and cool water to regulate the ocean's temperature. And my favorite for ocean acidification is osteoporosis of the seas. How many of you are familiar with osteoporosis? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> As ocean acidification changes the composition of our oceans, animals at the bottom of the food chain are getting brittle shells, brittle bones. They're not able to build those strong bones they need in order to survive. And that's called osteoporosis of the sea. So these are some of the tools in the toolbox. The last thing that we end with is a solution. And this solution is really important because we focus on community level solutions that foster hope and instill a sense of efficacy. Hope is the most important part of behavior change. If you feel like you're never gonna make a difference, why even bother, right? So the three things that Noki teaches you to, fo to focus on are energy shift, energy efficiency, and talking about it. So what this looks like in action. Future generations depend on the decisions we make today. By working together, we can protect special places like Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary from a warming ocean. Animals breathe in carbon dioxide, or animals breathe in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. Plants take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen back into the system. It's a cyclical process. Lots of circles happening here. But what happens when there's too much of a good thing, too much carbon dioxide? When we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and methane to power our homes, drive our cars, transport our food around the country, carbon dioxide gets released into this atmosphere. This carbon dioxide that's extra from this circle is called rampant carbon dioxide because there's too much of it. The carbon dioxide in this circle is our regular carbon dioxide. It's part of the system. This rampant carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere and creates a heat trapping blanket. Now, our regular atmosphere is kind of like a sheet on top of your bed. Now, what happens in the middle of summer if someone threw a comforter on top of you? You're going to be hot. It's going to be uncomfortable. That's what's happening to our Earth's atmosphere right now. There's more carbon dioxide, so that blanket is getting thicker. For corals, long periods of warmer ocean water can lead to coral bleaching. What happens in coral bleaching? Anybody? You all probably know. Corals get hot, the zooxanthellae produces a toxin, they kick that zooxanthellae out. Corals turn white, and what happens when these corals are bleached for an extended period of time? They die. Future generations depend on the decisions that we make today, and we need to rethink how fossil fuels are used in our communities. Many communities, like those in South Florida, are supporting local food and farmers through community-supported agriculture, or CSAs, where consumers invest in a farmer's crop and receive a share of the crops in return at harvest time. Buying food from local farmers helps reduce the amount of rampant carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere by reducing the transportation necessary to get food into our grocery stores and homes. You can find a CSA in your community by going to the Florida Department of Agriculture's website. By making sensible decisions about our food, we can make good decisions that will impact future generations. And that's Noki in action. Another really interesting piece of research that we're integrating into our education program is through a marketing company called Heartwired. Heartwired research leverages the way that people's emotions, identity, and values all come at this crux of decision making. And so what they found in a study done over lockdown was that people tend to identify with the ocean in six different realms. Now I'm gonna do a little preface here and say, I'm gonna ask you which one you identify with. So when you see it, hold on to it. We can go back, don't worry. But I'm gonna go through the six of them very quickly. I connect to the ocean through my senses. I love feeling the sand between my toes, the sound of the waves, the smell of the air, and the sights of taste of being at the ocean. God's beautiful creation. I connect to the ocean through my faith. I feel that the ocean is God's beautiful creation. Amazing wildlife. I connect to the ocean through the animals that call it home. The ocean is filled with the most amazing wildlife on earth. Laws and policies. I support laws and policies that protect the ocean. The laws and policies we pass can help protect the ocean for future generations. Feeling at peace. 
I love the ocean because of the way it makes me feel. When I'm at the ocean, I feel at peace. Family traditions. I connect to the ocean by spending time with my family. I have fond memories of spending time with my family at the ocean. Now, I am offline, so I'm actually going to skip the mentee, because I'm assuming I'm not online anymore for those people either. Um, so does anyone feel like sharing which one they identify with? Which one resonates with you? All senses, I connect to the ocean through my senses. God's beautiful creation, I connect to the ocean through my faith. Amazing wildlife, I connect to the ocean through the animals. I connect to the ocean through laws and policies because I feel like it should be protected. Feeling at peace because of the way it makes me feel and family traditions. How many of you are amazing wildlife? That's the one I thought would be the most popular. The food, you connect to the ocean through the food chain. Yeah, so we actually, we did through seafood. So we actually did this study um, at our outreach events last year, and I don't have the data yet. I'm still going through it. Um, but that was a thing we got quite a bit, um, was that amazing wildlife. I connect to the ocean through the seafood that I eat. Oh, or is it all sense? Oh, see. I'm telling you, like, half and half between amazing wildlife and being at peace. Yeah, there's a lot that you're probably going to be, like, in the middle of. Anyone family traditions? Spending time with my family helps me connect to the ocean. So I, I feel like most people are amazing wildlife. Is that? Some of you are like, I don't know, Lindsay. I have no idea. I almost feel though like the your next one. The laws and policies are the outcome of the other five. It is. That one's a weird one. Um, in their data, when you take a, a real deep look at it, there's actually a lot of support for laws and policies to help protect the ocean, um, which is surprising, right? Because when you do surveys of people individually and locally, that is not the case usually. Like, Generally, as a rule of thumb, depending on where you are in the country, most people do not support more regulations. But in their national survey, it did. It got actually a pretty high amount. What, what, what do you think is the motivation? I mean, I can see the two of them. Motivate is a really complicated word, word in the psychology and sociology world because motivations can be really difficult to quantify. So I do not have the answer to that question. say, oh, button snapper, we're putting a law policy in place to increase the, uh, the legal size of button snapper. So that's going to increase the, the overall size of the fish for the next generation. So Preserve. preserving it, yes. So looking at catch sizes. It's not going to probably sound that great for everybody who's a fisherman down here, but for future generations for bigger fish. But the wise fishermen understand. Yeah, and that could be one of the one of the driving forces behind it. Like I said, motivations really hard to quantify. You can go round and round with a psychologist and sociologist for hours on that topic alone. <clears throat> now I can't talk about recreation without talking about Blue Star. How many of you are familiar with the Blue Star program? Most folks in here, excellent. So for those of you that don't know, Blue Star is a program to connect folks with operators who are taking the next steps into their conservation and educating about the sanctuary. Now, how many of you use Blue Star as kind of an indicator for who you want to go out with if you're booking a charter, snorkel, something like that? A couple people do, but most people don't, right? Uh, what we found out is most people don't know Blue Star exists. <clears throat> and when you hear the kind of the chatter around town, uh, some of the dive guides are like, why do we have to give this talk anyway? So I'm gonna talk about a study that was done because Blue Star was independently evaluated in 2012. Researchers here off here in Key Largo found that when people were diving, 97% of the divers touched the reef during a dive. Yeah, and that, that's crazy, right? Insane. Ready to have your mind blown even more? 55% of those touches were unintentional, which means that 45% of them were intentional, right? Mind blown, crazy. In their study, they found that previous education, so conservation courses through different dive organizations or nonprofits in the area, didn't have any effect on whether someone would touch the reef or not during a dive. What they did find, however, was the quality of the Blue Star briefing did. 
have an impact. It actually reduced the number of diver intentional touches on the reef. Some people are new to diving down here, right? <laughs> their regulators dangle, their fins are everywhere. You're just like, oh, goodness gracious. That's part of the diving experience, right? Like, you got to learn. We all were there once. If, you, if someone tells you they weren't, they're lying. <laughs> People who took trips with Blue Star operators who got the complete Blue Star briefing were less likely to make contact with the reef than other divers in the area, regardless of how many conservation courses they took, regardless of their experience as a diver, regardless if they were male or female, all of that. The Blue Star briefing is very important. So if you're on a Blue Star charter and someone doesn't give a Blue Star briefing, let them know that it's a research-backed thing. It's important. As an interpreter and an educator, one of the tools in my toolbox to connect people to this, because when I show this to my mom, my mom's like, look at that trash. <laughs> I hope she's not watching. <laughs> for, so for some people, me telling them that a ship is 180 foot long and was powered by a certain steam engine is cool for them, right? But for my mother and my sister in rural Virginia who think this is just a pile of trash, that's not the part that they find really cool about it. They find the story really cool. Oh, well, a shipwreck on molasses was sunk because it ran aground and it was carrying cotton and that cotton expanded and blew a hole in the side of the ship. That stuff is cool. So one of the ways that you can help us be able to tell good stories is when you see stuff, leave it in place. Archaeologists like Matt Lawrence and Brenda Altmeyer and Corey Malcolm and the folks at Biscayne, they are working to figure out these stories. Some of them may never be uncovered, but one piece of pottery can mean the difference between finding out who a ship might be versus not. So if you think that you found something cool, please tell us. We like to see cool stuff too. It might already be in our database. If so, great. If not, even better. We love stuff that we haven't found before. But you can help ensure future appreciation for these ships and the telling of these people's stories by just leaving stuff alone. Volunteering is important. If Blue Star is something that you like and is important to you, we have a new volunteer program we are, where we are training people to evaluate our Blue Star operators. You can go on the Blue Star trip and tell us how they did. I have a lot of computer work, and they're always looking to reduce the amount of time I spend on the boat. And then when I go on the boat, I need to be going out looking for these guys and those guys and all of that good stuff. So you can help us by evaluating Blue Star operators, joining our maritime heritage team, and helping to uncover these shipwreck stories. That is Emily, <laughs> our former Eco Discovery Center manager. <laughs> Educating and talking about the ocean is, can be a little bit complicated. It is something that requires training. Um, and people, like many of the educators that I see in this room and am familiar with, are professionals and they are good at what they do because they continue to learn and grow in the field of education and continue to receive that training. So I hope you all have enjoyed a little peek behind the curtain at just a sprinkle of the psychology and sociology we do. Um, if anyone's interested in getting super nerdy, the Eco Discovery Center, um, I like to walk around Eco Discovery Center and tell people all about why I pick certain fonts, <laughs> certain colors, why I use the word methane instead of natural gas. Um, I like to nerd out about those items because these are the things that educators stress about. And when they think about the word choices, they're very purposeful. So I hope you learned maybe something new about history. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you were like, oh, I knew all that history stuff because I'm Brad Bertelli's best friend. <laughs> and I hope you are. You can come teach me some stuff because I'm still learning. But I hope some of the psychology and sociology stuff was new to you and it was something that you had never heard before. And you're like, huh, these educators. They really have to think about a lot of stuff when they talk. And with that, I know I've run over, but I'm going to open the floor for questions. Why do I use the word methane instead of natural gas? Anyone know? Anyone have any thoughts? That's my. Natural gas sounds good. In a Yale study done by the Yale Climate Program, they have found that people who identify as conservative tend to think of natural gas with a very positive feeling, whereas methane is neutral. And that's what typically we're going for as educators. We want neutral. We don't want bad. Um, we want in the middle. We want you to make your own decisions. So that's why we use methane instead. 
any questions for this? They were too stunned to speak. <laughs> They're like, Lindsay, I feel like I just attended a lecture at FIU. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. I learned a lot of history. Um, and as a fellow educator, I highly enjoyed it. So, yeah, Excellent. Yeah, so if uh, make sure you fill out those surveys because as a scientist, fill, out, fill them out honestly because as a scientist, data is going to help me as well. This is the first time I've done a presentation like this. If you really didn't like it, uh, my name is Derek Hagen, and I'm with Coral Restoration <laughs> Foundation. Derek's going to watch it because he likes professional. I didn't come in a good enough costume. Yeah, you didn't wear a hat. Yes. Yeah, please fill out those surveys, and you'll give them to Noah. There she is. There she is. Not me, Noah. Noah's a person. And with that, Lindsay, thank you very much. Thank you. Certificates. I'm glad we were able to. <laughs> <laughs> Off the Florida Keys bucket list. <laughs>